Hi there! Today's video is on how to make your own DIY vitamin D supplement. This DIY vitamin D supplement will last over a year in your pantry with near original potency. It's food and nature based, it's organic, it's DIY, and it's easy. I have packed this video full of information on how to make your own DIY vitamin D supplement. Yes, you can actually make it wrong, resulting in a minimal vitamin D. So be sure to watch this video from beginning to end so that you don't miss out any essential information for maximum success. Okay, so you only need three things. You need mushrooms with a specific type of feature that I will share with you shortly. You need sunshine and some glass jars. It's really that simplistic. I've divided this video into five parts, so here's what we're going to cover. In part one, I'm going to tell you the type of vitamin D that these sunshine mushrooms make and how it converts in your body into the useful form of vitamin D. In part two, I'm going to give you actual IU levels that you can expect from your sunshine mushrooms. Part three, I'm going to give you step by step how to make the mushrooms, including the specific feature that the mushrooms need to have. In part four, I'm going to share with you the mistakes to avoid and more tips for success. And in part five, I want to share with you an alternate method on how to make sunshine mushrooms without any sunshine. We have so much to cover, so let's get into it. Part one, the type of vitamin D your sunshine mushrooms are going to make. Okay, so in our food, vitamin D is found in typical two forms, the vitamin D2 and vitamin D3. Vitamin D2 is called ergocarciferol, and vitamin D3 is called cholecalciferol. Both need to be converted into calcitriol in order to become bioactive and useful in the body. Vitamin D3 is found in animal-based foods such as salmon or obtained through our skin through sunshine exposure. Vitamin D2 comes from plant sources like mushrooms. Now D2 is the type of vitamin D that your mushrooms will be producing. They will not be producing D3. There is a synthetic vitamin D2 out there that you'll find in your cheaper supplements that you can buy, but that's not the type of D2 we're dealing with. Now both vitamins D2 and D3 will help you get your D requirements, but they differ in a few important ways. Now both are effectively absorbed into the bloodstream, but they are metabolized differently in the liver. Now, as I mentioned earlier, both D2 and D3 need to be converted in the body in order to become calcitriol, which is the form of vitamin D that is useful to your body. This conversion and activation process is carried out in two enzymatic stages in the liver and in the kidneys. Vitamin D3 is more easily metabolized into its hormone form. It takes much longer for this hepatic conversion with vitamin D2 than it does for D3. Vitamin D2 also produces less calcitriol than an equal amount of D3. So you would need to take more vitamin D2 than D3 to achieve equivalent effectiveness. However, that's not going to be a problem with your sunshine mushrooms. Also an important note here is that vitamin D, both in D2 and D3, are fat soluble vitamins, which means you need to take them with some fat in your meal, like avocados, nuts, seeds, some salmon, foods cooked in a little ghee or olive oil, etc. Now there are some studies out there that will claim that D2 does not have effectiveness and therefore is just a waste of time to even take vitamin D2. Now I've researched both sides of the data comparing the D2 and the D3. I've read both arguments saying D2 is useful and D2 isn't useful to the body. From that research that I did, I believe that D2 in its natural form, such as in sunshine mushrooms, is effective in the body. However, at the same time, understanding the differences between D2 and D3. Now, these are just the basics with D2 and D3, and this is as far as I'm going to go with it in this video. If you want to learn more about the differences or how it's metabolized in your body, and if D2 is right for you, then I really encourage you to do your own self-educating research. And be sure to read research that is non-biased. So let's move on. Part two, what are the vitamin D2 levels that you can expect to get from your sunshine mushrooms? Mushrooms grow in indoors or outdoors that are typically sold at commercial outlets like the grocery store have very little to minimal vitamin D. However, they reserve great potential in hyper-producing it, even after they're cut and being sold in the grocery store. By the way, just a note, every time I say vitamin D, I am referring to D2. So the values that I'm going to be sharing with you come from a specific study on the hyperproduction of vitamin D in mushrooms. If you want to read the full article for reference, I'll leave a link in the description below. Several forms of organically grown mushrooms had a starting value of 100 IU vitamin D2. Compared were the vitamin D levels of three sets of mushrooms, all from the same crop. First was dried indoors, 
The second was dried outdoors in the sunlight with their gills facing down, and the third set of mushrooms was dried outdoors in the sunlight with their gills facing upwards for full sun exposure. The vitamin D levels in these mushrooms soared from 100 IU to 46,000 IU. Their stems, though, produced very little vitamin D, only about 900 IU. Notably, though, the vitamin D levels dropped on the third day, possibly due to overexposure to UV rays. When the sunshine dried mushrooms were tested nearly a year later, they preserved significant levels of the vitamin D. Now the values were probably much higher initially, having a gradual decline over the time, but nonetheless the values were still significant. The great news is, is if you make your mushrooms in the summer, you will have a plentiful reserve of vitamin D naturally sourced over the fall, winter, and spring. Now if you think going from 100 IU to 46,000 IU is pretty impressive, wait till part 5 when I give you the details on an alternate method of making sunshine mushrooms without actually any sunshine. Those levels will even knock your socks off. So stay tuned, you don't want to miss that. So back to part 2's topic on how much vitamin D is actually in these mushrooms. The next question may be how much of that vitamin D2 actually makes it into the bloodstream? Well, here's the summary of one study comparing 26 people who took a vitamin D supplement to 26 others ingesting vitamin D enriched mushrooms four times a week for five weeks, researchers at the University Medical Center in Freiburg, Germany found that serum levels of vitamin D were similar. They used button mushrooms exposed to UV light that resulted in 20,000 IU of the vitamin D. Subjects ingested 120 grams of vitamin D enriched mushrooms, which is about a quarter of a pound, roughly a handful. The results showed similar levels of vitamin D were absorbed in the blood in both groups. Those who ingested a supplement in pill form and those who put freshly cooked mushrooms in a soup. At the end of the study, both groups serum vitamin D levels increased to this number right here in the bloodstream which is considered to be a healthy baseline level. And of course, care should be taken to avoid over supplementation as serum levels over 125 can be hazardous. So you inspired and excited about making some sunshine mushrooms? Awesome, let's get into part three, step by step, how to make your vitamin D rich sunshine mushrooms. I've got some organic mushrooms here, oyster, shiitake, and button. First, this is the underside of the shiitake, and take note of the exposed fins. The fins are these gill-like structures on the underside or inside of a mushroom. It's this fin exposure that will generate the hyperproduction of vitamin D. Since shiitakes have a lot of fin exposure on the underside, they make for a good choice in making sunshine mushrooms. This is the underside of an oyster mushroom. It's practically all fin on the underside, even more so than the shiitake. For me, this is my favorite type of mushroom to use. It also tends to be a bit less expensive than the shiitakes, but can sometimes be a little harder to find. This is the underside of a common white button mushroom. Practically no fin exposure at all, so this is not the best choice. However, if you stick around to later in this video, I'll show you what you can do to make these effective, but just using a different technique. Oyster mushrooms come in these clumps, so I'm going to break off each mushroom and lay it on a cookie sheet. With the shiitake, I'm going to cut the dried up stump part off of the stem, then lay them out on the cookie sheet just like I did with the oyster mushrooms. I'm going to experiment with these portobello mushrooms due to their size and large fin exposure. I'm trimming the edge just to further expose the fins. Let's find out if this is a good choice to use. After the mushrooms are laid out on the baking sheets, put them in a place where they're going to receive full sun for at least six hours up to eight. Don't leave the mushrooms out overnight. They could reabsorb the moisture in the air from the evening, night, and morning dews and the humidity shifts that come with temperature changes. Bring them inside, but no need to cover them. Around 11 a.m. on day two, set them out again in full sun for six to eight hours. These are my mushrooms at the end of day two. They are fully dried to a crisp, which is exactly what you want. Break your mushrooms to test their dryness. They should snap when they break, just like this.
If your mushrooms don't snap by the end of day two, finish drying them in a dehydrator until they do snap. If you remember from earlier, the research showed D levels began to drop on day three due to possible UV overexposure. To prevent that, finish drying in a dehydrator. This is just some standard white rice I'm using. I'm going to add a tablespoon to each jar as a moisture absorber just in case, although my mushrooms are completely dried and do snap in half. So this is really an extra precaution to ensure they stay dry in the jar. Add the mushrooms to the jar like so. No special tricks. Then place the lid on tightly so that no moisture can get in. That's it. As far as the portobello mushroom experiment, that really didn't turn out as I was hoping and I'll share with you why in the next part of this video. Now you don't want to miss part four with those mistakes to avoid. The mistakes that I made that I want to share with you so that you can go straight into success. So let's hop into it. Part four, mistakes to avoid. The number one thing that is most important in making your sunshine mushrooms is time of year. You have to make these in the summer months. If you live in the northern hemisphere in a latitude north of Los Angeles, then getting any significant vitamin D levels from the sun October through February is going to be nominal to zero, especially the farther north you live. So I live in Montana, so those who live in Seattle or Alberta, UK, Ireland, yeah, good luck. You're not going to be getting any vitamin D during those months. So really important, you got to get this done in the summer. And for all my friends in the southern hemisphere, same goes for you. You got to do it in your summer months, which I know is the exact opposite for us in the northern hemisphere. Because you know, even if you set your mushrooms out on a bright sunny day in the middle of winter and they dry up to a lovely crisp, they're not going to have any vitamin D levels increase from what you bought them from the store. And if it's not summer, stay tuned to part five because I'll share with you the alternate method. Okay, so another lesson that I learned is don't use a mushroom that's too thick. I thought I would experiment with the portobello mushroom because it has so much fin exposure on the underside and the truth is it just didn't dry fast enough in those two days. If you look at this footage, see it's still even meaty even when the other mushrooms are dried to a crisp and I'm going to turn it over and see it even molded a little bit because it just wasn't drying fast enough. There's so many other wonderful mushroom alternatives. Just skip the portobello and do the oyster, the shiitake, the mitake, or I'm going to share with you how to do the button mushrooms because they're going to be a little different. Next is avoid humidity. Your mushrooms will not dry into a crisp like they need to so that they can have long-term storage. So if you're in southern Georgia or Florida or, or Louisiana, this method may not work for you. But that's just my theory because I don't live in those places, so you test it out and see what happens. And also remember from the research study that I was reading from earlier is that the vitamin D levels begin to drop on day three due to overexposure of the UV rays. So just leaving the portobello mushrooms out for three, four, or five days for them to completely dry will actually start working against the mushrooms. So two days is the key, and you need mushrooms that will dry into a crisp within those two days. All right, this is a small little thing, but again, a lesson that I learned. Watch out for wind, because when your mushrooms start to dry, and they will pretty quickly on the first day, they become light as a feather, and the breeze will pick them up, and before you know it, you've got dried mushrooms going across your backyard. So, watch out for wind. All right, and the next one is don't procrastinate. When your mushrooms are done on day two, get them in the glass jar with the rice and the lid on ASAP. I procrastinated for a couple days. I had them sitting in the house, and then one day I was walking through the kitchen. I'm like, why do I smell mushrooms? And then I realized it's coming from my dried mushrooms that had absorbed the humidity inside the house, and they began rehydrating and began molding. So from there on, I always took the mushrooms directly from the sun into the jar with the rice and the lid without procrastinating. All right, so this is a really vital piece of information, I think. If you're not able to get the mushrooms that have a lot of gill exposure, like the oyster, mataki, and shiitake, you can use button mushrooms. Now look at this comparison. See these button mushrooms from the grocery store? They have practically zero gill exposure on the underside. So this is not gonna work just to cut their stems off and put them up to dry. They're also really thick and meaty, so they wouldn't dry fast enough. Here's what you do. You need to slice these mushrooms for more sun exposure onto the ergostol rich surface areas of the mushroom. Ergostol is a precursor to vitamin D2. Exposure onto this ergostol rich surface area by UV light causes a photochemical reaction within the mushroom, this ergostol rich surface area 
converting it from ergostol into ergocarciferol, which is vitamin D2. So that's why you need to slice them. Since they don't have any gills, you need to expose that ergostol rich surface area. I tested this out. See here, I'm slicing up the mushrooms. They only need to be about this thick. And then I set them out in the sun to dry and repeat just as you would with the other mushrooms as well. This might be really helpful for you guys who don't have access to those kinds of mushrooms. They also tend to be a little bit less expensive. Okay, let's jump into part five, the alternate method on how to make sunshine mushrooms without any sunshine. This is a great alternative if you're watching this video in the winter time and you don't wanna wait till summer to start making your vitamin D mushrooms. So listen to this research study that was done by Robert Beelman of Penn State University. He was one of the pioneers that learned this. Pulsing high intensity beams of UV light could generate vitamin D. When measured, the vitamin D concentrations of shiitakes exposed to no light, exposed to sunlight with gills up, and exposed to continuous UV light after slicing, the results were impressive. The indoor UV light was more intense than sunlight. The mushrooms exposed gills up in the sun resulted in 46,000 IU of vitamin D. Mushrooms exposed to 14 hours of UVB light produced 267,000 IU of vitamin D. Now it wasn't tested, but it is theory that the sliced mushrooms would produce more vitamin D since the ergosol surface area was increased. However, the sun is a convenient and free method of getting your UV light for your mushrooms and setting up a UV chamber light and buying all the supplies and doing it right is not convenient and free. Just a caution I have to put in there, using a UVB lamp can cause damage to your eyes and your skin, so don't attempt this without taking necessary precautions. You'll need to put together a safe UVB light chamber that will keep you protected by keeping the UVB light away and off of you, yet exposing the mushrooms. So be sure to do proper research before attempting that. I hope that you learned so much from this video and I also hope that you're not going to delay in jumping into making those sunshine mushrooms if it's summer. And if you decide to do the UVB light chamber for winter mushrooms, leave me a comment below and let me know how that goes. I'd love to hear about it. Hey, so check out some of my other videos right here. Hit that subscribe button to be a part of my channel, Clean Food Living, and I'll see you in my next video. Have a great day. Bye.